I'm Margaret Floyd Barry, Master Restorative Wellness Practitioner, Author, Speaker, and Executive Director of Restorative Wellness Solutions. Each week, I interview the world's leading experts in functional health and nutrition to uncover the latest research findings, case studies, and evidence-based clinical applications for reversing chronic disease, including actionable insights and strategies you can implement immediately to elevate your practice, increase your impact, and change the way health is delivered. Hello, hello, everybody. Today's episode was so much fun and one where I in particular learned a ton. I got to chat with Brian Maurer, one of the co-founders of Bristle Health, which is the oral microbiome test. It was such a great conversation about what kind of information we can get about our overall health through a microbiome test. Everything from information about your body's ability to produce nitric oxide to the six different types of halitosis. And I don't know about you, but I did not know that there were that many. It's a great conversation for both practitioners and consumers alike. So whether you're wanting to bring oral microbiome testing into your practice as a clinician, or if you're just curious about oral microbiome testing and you want to try it yourself and see what you learn about your own health with it, you're going to love this episode. Also, stick around to the end because Brian shares an amazing offer for practitioners that you don't want to miss. Enjoy. Brian received his BA in International Business from the University of San Diego, and after receiving his degree, he spent nine years in the commercial organization of DNA sequencing companies, driving adoption of genomic technology and applications into new and emerging markets. He has a passion for applying novel technology in healthcare to improve patient outcomes. So Brian, welcome. It's so good to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. Could not be more excited to be speaking with you. and all the lovely people listening. Wonderful. Well, what I would love to do is I'd like to start with personal background and hear a little yeah. bit more about your story. So, you know, what you, you have this background, you know, business, tech, and then, you know, into health. What is it about the oral microbiome that seems very niche? What was it about that that intrigued you? Yeah, like most, I think, innovators, it ultimately boiled down to trying to solve my own problem. So mm -hmm. I would not be, if you looked at my dental x-rays, I would not be the first pick, you'd think, to be starting <laughs> an oral health company. Um, really was working in the genetics and genomics industry and had exposure to this cutting edge technology that was being used in all sorts of applications, non-invasive prenatal testing, nutrigenomics, cancer genomics, gut mm -hmm. microbiome testing. Um, and I had all these different things I could measure of myself, my continuous glucose monitor, you know, all these different things. But what I struggled the most with was actually my oral health. So I struggled with chronic tooth decay, gum disease issues, and, you know, really despite doing what I thought I was supposed to be doing, I had no real way to measure it. Hmm. And that was really the impetus behind Bristle, was to give us a way to really understand what's happening biologically driving oral symptoms. Um, and as we dug in deeper, I'm sure we'll get into this, we realized oral microbiome does not stop in the mouth and impacts so many other facets of our health. Uh, and from there, Bristle was born. Um, well, let's let's talk about, you know, let's talk about Bristle because I think it's, I, I love this idea. You know, we often, we are big believers in testing here. You know, we test all the things, right? We're looking at the gut, we're looking at food sensitivity tests, blood work, like you, like, you know, working with CGMs, hormones, and you're right that the oral cavity can be a little bit mysterious. And here we are, most of us functional nutrition professionals, we mm -hmm. can recognize the absolutely vital importance of oral health and the oral microbiome. Um, and yet we don't have a way of assessing and determining how much of that is influencing other health outcomes. So let's, let's talk first and foremost, and just kind of walk us through some of the logistics of the test. Like how does someone take it and, and what are you specifically looking for when you're, when you are running their sample? Sure. So very straightforward in terms of how you take the sample. Um, so basically we have a collection kit and a funnel that clips into the collection kit and you'll spit it directly into the tube. We include a stabilizing reagent, so you'll shake it up and that'll preserve it at room temperature. So you don't need to worry about ice packs, anything like that. It's very easy to be taken at home by patients uh, and that's why we designed it that way. And then what's happening once it hits our lab is we're using a, an approach called shotgun metagenomics which I know is a mouthful, but as the name implies, 
it's taking a shotgun approach to looking at the oral microbiome. So we are looking at all 800 plus bacteria and fungi from the oral cavity from that single sample. And the reason we do that is we wanna give you comprehensive insights, not only into things like tooth decay and gum inflammation, but also measuring those beneficial bacteria that we know are critical to our health, but so often overlooked, um, as well as different kinds of insights, like things like our gut, uh, gut impact, how oral bacteria can influence that, or even nitric oxide production or things like bad breath. So what we're doing is we're analyzing the genome of every single bacteria um, to really get as much information as is humanly possible about the microbiome. And then we give it back to you and your patient in a very easy to follow report. So is this a similar technology? And I'm gonna show the limitations of my understanding on actual lab technology, but I know, for example, we use the GI map mm -hmm. for stool samples and they use this PCR testing. And we always, you know, one of the ways we'll describe it sometimes to our clients is, you know, it's like looking for the genetics of things that aren't you kind of thing. Is that a similar idea? We're just looking for the genetic sort of footprint of these different organisms that can live in the mouth, both in terms of pathogens as well as beneficials? Absolutely. Um, so PCR and the GI map test, we are huge fans of. Um, really impressive what they've built and how many people they're helping. Um, our technology is a bit of an evolution on PCR. So okay. PCR is really good at measuring a handful of targets. Um, so if you're interested in uh, a dozen pathogens or so, uh, it's really great for measuring the quantity of those species, which I think GI map has so dialed in. It's very nice. Yeah. Um, with our test, what we're doing is instead of targeting what you're looking for, we look at absolutely everything. So we use a newer machine. It's called a next generation sequencer. I don't know why they're all such big words, um, <laughs> but that was actually what our expertise was in. So okay. same concept though, what we're really concerned about is this other organ in your mouth, this microbiome and how that is interacting with one another and how that ultimately influences the oral environment and your oral and overall health. Okay. That, and then, and yes, looking at 800 or so, if that, if that, that was the number you said, 800, right. that's, a, that's definitely a heck of a lot more than what the GI map is looking at. So when we're, when you're dealing with such vast quantities, are you then kind of um, mapping it? Like, how are you making that assessment of, are you quantifying it? And mm -hmm. how are you analyzing it to understand the different levers and influences on different oral health manifestations, let's call them? Yeah, I think that's where the real magic is. Um, so on one hand, we are measuring each individual bacteria. So we're mm -hmm. analyzing all of them and measuring each one. Okay. And what we're really concerned about is not just the abundance of individual pathogens, because in the oral cavity, we've realized that doesn't drive uh, the pathogenesis of disease as much as a general shift in the environment. So one example is there's a bacteria called Fusobacterium nucleatum, um, and normally it's happy in our microbiomes. 95% of people have it, likely is doing some functions we actually need. But if another species, Tanerella forsythia, enters the microbiome, those two don't play nicely together, and all of a sudden it becomes pathogenic. So on one hand, we're measuring Fusobacterium nucleatum, but we're also looking at those relationships that we know from literature and from our initial study with the University of Pacific School of Dentistry. And then we're looking at that in relation to our beneficial bacteria. So, you know, we really want to understand not just do we have a couple pathogens, but are they comprising 10% of the microbiome, 50% of the microbiome, 100% of the microbiome, because that lends us to what types of interventions are going to be most effective. Okay. That's fantastic. So, when we look at this, you know, we look at the information that we get from it. Let's look at it. I want to talk through what we get from it. And I want to talk through it from the two perspectives because you have the, because this is, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but this is a consumer facing, you can as a practitioner open account, but also consumers can just go online and order this themselves, correct? Correct. Yes. Okay. So let's, let's kind of break it down between the two, because as practitioners, of course, we're looking of course, the information is, is very similar, but sometimes we'll look at it from, from a slightly different lens. So let's let's talk through some of the, you know, what are some of the uses, you know, a consumer um, coming to this? What kind of things would they be looking for and getting the most out of this test? Yeah, so um, one of the curses of having such a breadth of things we look at is that it makes this answer quite long. So I'll try to keep it condensed. No, but... let's go for it. We want to unpack it all, so don't try to tighten. <laughs> cool. Um, so one of the things 
uh, we're most con- so we look at a broad spectrum of conditions. So obviously we look at things like tooth decay. So mm-hmm. people who are having chronic decay, like myself, um, it can be a really good insight into seeing, do you have an abundance of those bacteria that release acid and actually lead to cavities? Or if you're struggling with chronic to- uh, chronic gum inflammation or gum disease, um, that's another great fit where we can actually measure those bacteria that are known to lead to gum disease and gum inflammation. Outside of that, uh, another common one is bad breath. So mm-hmm. bad breath is this condition that I think all too often gets brushed aside as just something that's a bit embarrassing. But um, you know what we found is it can be very an early signal um, preceding a lot of these same species that lead to gum disease and gum inflammation. Um, and it can be a complex condition. We've actually identified what we call the six types of bad breath. So we can help somebody figure out, are these, are these uh, malodors coming from t- your tongue or your gum line or fungi? And how can we help tease out what's going to be the best intervention for you? Can you, can you just, it sounds like you just gave us three. Can you give us the other three? Cause that's fascinating thinking about the three different types of bad breath. And if you know them off the top of your head. So you said gum line, you said tongue, you said fungal. Yes, I would imagine bacterial would be another one. I'm making this up, but no. So the, the majority of these are bacterial. So there's tongue coating, which I'm most familiar with. Cause that's my predisposition. So I tongue scrape twice a day and okay. will not leave home without it. Um, there's inflammatory species on the gum line. Yeah. There's non-inflammatory species on the gum line. So there we can tease out, are these a bacteria that would often lead to gum disease or not? Um, we have the fungal, and then I'm blanking on the other two, but I will dig those up while we continue. Yeah, and so this is fascinating because you think, and I can think of certain clients, you know, so one of the things that we see with with bad breath, sometimes there can be a digestive issue, right? Like you can be a sign, for example, of like H. pylori food just sitting in the stomach and not moving through. Are you able with this to actually identify if that's also a causing factor or is it really specifically looking exclusively at what we're seeing in the mouth? Yeah, so we are looking exclusively at the mouth. So I did find the other two. They're opportunistic enterobacteriaceae um, and then intermittent bad breath. Um, Don't ask me to say that five times fast. But, um, you know, that's one of the things that can be really interesting about the test is negative results can often be telling about then what the cause might be. Um, So even things like tooth decay, if we know someone's struggling with rampant tooth decay, but their results come back and they don't have those tooth decay causing bacteria, then we can start to look at things like, could this possibly be mouth breathing or a vitamin D deficiency or some other root cause of what's actually leading to those symptoms. So kind of addition by subtraction in terms of getting those insights. This is a beautiful segue into like an example of what we would be thinking about this clinically as practitioners, because that's probably beyond what most consumers are thinking of, or they might be curious of that. But as a practitioner, that can be incredibly helpful guiding clinical strategies. Okay. So we talked about, so continue on. You said there's lots of different examples. I, I, when you said, as soon as you said six types of bad breath, I was like, oh, wow, we gotta, we gotta dig into that. So no, and it's a fun one. I'll, uh, I'll make sure to send you the blog. Um, so anybody who wants to check it out, we wrote a whole article about it. Um, we try to publish any interesting findings we find. Um, I actually see, there's a question actually in the chat here, which just relates exactly to this. While we're on the topic of bad breath, Molly is asking what about tonsil stones and bad breath? Is that something that you're seeing here too? Yeah, so we won't diag- we won't detect tonsil stones explicitly, but mm-hmm. generally those are caused by an imbalance of certain bacteria that end up leading to tonsil stones. So in that sense, we're detecting the high abundance of those species related to tonsil stones. Um, and that's where, you know, the test is a great component, but as you had let in, you know, where the rubber hits the road is when we can really start to marry these insights with clinicians and those types of things that you're aware of and you can help patients uh, identify. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Okay. Sorry. I interrupted you. You can keep going with the other, other things that we, other information that we can get from this. No, these are great questions. I love them. Um, other ones include gut impact. So little known fact, or probably to your audience, a better known fact, but oral bacteria actually have a decent amount of research supporting what we call the oral gut axis. So how inflammatory oral bacteria can actually translocate to the gut and either directly or indirectly lead to or are associated with certain conditions. So directly being actually translocating, 
that Fusobacterium nucleatum species I mentioned earlier, though in the mouth very common, a subspecies has actually been associated with colorectal cancer. Um, but then others, you know, if they're triggering inflammation and releasing these inflammatory factors, that's where we may start to see associations with things like IBS, IBD, Crohn's disease. So, you know, if you're doing a lot of work on the gut, the oral microbiome can be a great complement to actually seeing, are we seeing inflammation possibly being exacerbated by the oral cavity? Right. Excellent. And then another one is nitric oxide. So I'm sure everyone on here knows the importance of nitric oxide. Um, something I hadn't known when we started Bristle was that oral bacteria play a key role in producing nitric oxide, particularly in extracting it from dietary nitrate. Yeah. So this is another thing we measure where, again, a great complement with other work you're doing to boost mm -hmm. nitric oxide, looking at that oral complement. And that's more on the patient insights. Yeah. On the clinician side, this is where we, I think, really get into the oral systemic connections. Um, so oral bacteria and oral pathogens have been associated with cognitive disorders, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, uh, cancers, as I mentioned, autoimmune diseases. And this is where it's still an emerging science, but you know we're working with functional medicine practitioners who have patients with autoimmune disease or patients with chronic inflammation, um, rheumatoid arthritis as well, very commonly associated where we can look at one more data point to see, is this inflammation stemming possibly from the oral cavity? It's fascinating. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is so fascinating. It's, the, the body is so amazingly and beautifully interconnected. I love, yeah. I love how this is, um, I love how this all comes together. So um, you kind of answered my next question, which was really like, can we be looking at a bit different and bigger systemic conditions that aren't just limited to the mouth and the answer it sounds like is an absolute resounding yes now i just want to say for those listening this this test is not an expensive test please can you remind us how much i mean it's well remind me how much it is admit it didn't yeah. seem exactly on our job. website it's 169 dollars if yeah. somebody would just, just go purchase it there and then so we have that is pricing for clinicians yeah that's a that's a really in a inexpensive test for the kind of information that you can can get um, here would you be able to we talked about sharing screens so yep. everybody who's here live this is a we've not done this before so bear with us um yep. but i would love it if you could share your screen sure and i will speak to it as well so if you can't yeah. see it i'll try to give you uh my best okay. interpretation of what we're looking at so this first screen um so i guess to preface giving you a list of 200 to 300 bacteria probably won't be that informative. Um, so what we wanna do is really make it informative and digestible uh, into what the key takeaways and insights are. Yeah. So that starts with our overview page here. And these are uh, actually one of our founders old results, but we will just mm -hmm. call it demo patient for now. Perfect. So the first thing you'll see here is that what we do is we consolidate the insights into scores. So each one of these scores is zero to 10. Um, and here we can see beneficial bacteria. Here we see we have an average abundance. Under each score, we'll indicate, do you have a low, average, or um, above average abundance? And when it's related to a condition, is that uh, putting the patient at risk of developing that condition? So here we'll first see the oral health insights. And here's where we can see beneficial bacteria, gum inflammation it appears this patient's actually at risk of gum inflammation um, but not tooth decay so they actually have very low abundance of tooth decay causing bacteria to the right here is where we'll give you just a plain english takeaway of what that means or how to interpret that score um, something you can pass on to your patient Perfect. continuing further Here's where we'll see those additional health and wellness insights I mentioned. So things like halitosis, uh, bad breath, actually indicating, do we find an abundance of those bacteria that are known to produce malodorous compounds? We have gut impact, which uh, I had touched on earlier, and nitric oxide as well. One score here I hadn't touched on is our diversity score. So uh, if you're familiar with the, oral, with the gut microbiome, you know generally higher diversity is just associated with better outcomes. The oral cavity is a little different. So generally, if we see somebody at an extremely high diversity, that tends to be associated with oral microbiome dysbiosis, so gum disease. And on the very low end, that can be indicative of an opportunistic infection. 
which we have started to detect and uh, actually has a pretty interesting case story we, we might need to get into later. Oh, yes, very much. Yeah. So next, if we continue down, this is where we'll show you those oral and systemic health associations I was talking about. So within the report, we'll show you some of the species that are more well-known or well-documented in re literature to be associated with these systemic health conditions. And for each microbe, we'll indicate, were they in a high percentile of that abundance? Do they have a high level of that species? And which systemic health associations have those actually been associated with? So again, if you are factoring this into some of your other patient work, um, can really give you some insights into, particularly for cardiovascular disease and things like that, is the oral microbiome or the oral cavity elevating some of those signals that we might want to try and address as a component of comprehensive care. Now, when we're looking at the individual species like this, yeah. um, or I guess I should say individual microbes, are we, is this piece, it's looking at them individually. So it's not, I, am I understanding correctly that when you look at something like the bad breath score, or you're looking at the overall diversity or, you know, the decay, that's when you're looking at the relationships um, and factoring that kind of into your algorithm. But here you're just looking straight up at individual species prevalence and then the associated risk factors. Is that correct? Correct. You've got okay. it. So here is where we're more so just giving you insight into the individual species that have been associated with systemic health conditions. Again, just to give you insights and to give your patients awareness of what these have been associated with. What we can do on any score is actually click on it. And that'll take us to a more detailed view. So we have this more detailed view for every score. And here's where you can see the different bacteria we factored into that score. So we see the gum inflammation score is high, which as you said, is what we derive, uh, what we created to give you that overarching takeaway of um, those relative abundances, that balance of the community and what that translates to in terms of risk. We do have all the species here though. So we can see here, for example, Porphyromonas endodontalis, but we can click on that and learn a bit more about it, see how common it is, see what it's associated with. We also have a number of different attributes here. So we can see, is this gram negative? Is it anaerobic? And even is it sensitive to any particular probiotic compound? So certain species are sensitive to other probiotics. So again, really trying to give you a lot of insights, not just into what's there, but how we might start to think about addressing it. That's very comprehensive. Thank you. Yeah, the goal is to give you as much information as you want. So we're really down to nerd out and deep dive, but also give you a way to present it to your patients and get the key takeaways in a digestible format. Yeah, which is always the challenge to do the two simultaneously. It looks like you've done a really good job of this. Okay. Thank this you. This is great. Thank you. Yeah. The last thing I'll get to quickly is what do you do about it? Yes. So we have a few different, we have two different places here. So the first, we have this treatment plan tab. This is where for clinicians, you can come and get recommendations in terms of if you were referring out to a uh, dentist, for example, we'll have some types of adjunctive therapies that they may want to consider. But we also have a guide here, which we'll speak to later about all the different tools at your disposal for helping your patients mm -hmm. that um, we can click on this at home care guide where we'll actually give you at home recommendations or things that you can recommend to your patient to try and improve their balance. And we also have this in the home care section here where we can see even things like how nitrate or dietary nitrate can influence the beneficial bacteria and happy to keep going there or, uh, you know, double click wherever okay. is helpful. Yeah, no, this is, this is excellent. So I'm, I'm thinking through some like clinical use cases here, um, yes. because that's one of the, you know, I'm thinking through, I'm already seeing some questions here. Maybe the, maybe the best way we can do this is to actually go through some scenarios, but just as a big picture, before we dial into the real specifics, I'm putting, you know, my practitioner hat on here. Yeah. Um, when would be, you know, when would be times when I would think, okay, 
The, I mean, I can I can make an argument that everybody should have this done. I think we, you know, this is one of those things that I think it's it's just like you're talking about, like CGMs. I think all of us understanding how our body is responding to certain food inputs is important. Um, yep. But understanding our oral health, I think, is important. But just when we're thinking clinically for a moment, we always have to make decisions about what tests to do at what point. When would you recommend thinking thinking as a functional nutritionist as much as you're able to do that yeah. um when would should we be considering this type of test for yeah. our clients yeah and you all are the experts so i will not do too much of an impression but you know when we think about the clinical manifestations that make a lot of sense obviously you aren't performing oral exams probably generally or looking at people's teeth but if people are complaining about bad breath like we talked about or if someone is do if you're already doing a workup on their gut health mm -hmm. um that's another really good opportunity mm -hmm. where this can fit in as you mentioned it's quite a bit cheaper than some other gut health tests um but also can be complementary in terms of maybe we can find something in the oral cavity that's helping tip us off to some gut conditions as well or some gut inflammation um outside of that i see what are my favorites are the edge cases where I already see a couple different patient examples in the chat where we have folks who, and we get patients all the time who are struggling with symptoms that uh, include burning mouth syndrome or have abscessing or any type of other inflammation that we know might be manifesting in oral symptoms. Mm -hmm. Testing with bristle can really help uncover, are we seeing a microbial root cause related to that condition. Um, so those are just a few of them, but um, we have practitioners, as you said, who are using it as part of their workup now, where if right. they test and find low nitric oxide levels, or if they know the patient has a history of gum disease or a history of right. tooth decay, can be a great task because not everybody's going to see their dentist and i would say most dentists don't have this yet so that can be is great. this something that can detect so people who have had historically uh, uh you know like root canals or other like comprehensive dental work done one of the things that we know is that there can be hidden infections within that that can actually go systemic Mm -hmm. Will this test help give us a clue to some of those types of things that might be beyond the scope of a nutrition professional, but we can be referring out to, a, you know, their, a dentist or, or whatnot? Is it going to give us that level of detail or is this more, let's say, I don't want to say superficial in a bad way, but more just sort of like what's happening in the mouth? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, so I'll caution that it isn't something we've studied explicitly. So we haven't actually studied comparing local sites to, of an, uh, let's say there's an infected root canal. We haven't yeah. checked that specifically. But okay. um, what literature has shown is that the process of generating saliva and the fact that our oral microbiomes constantly shed means that even subgingival bacteria, so that means below the gum line, uh, are often detected very comprehensively from salivary tests like ours, mm -hmm. so from saliva tests. So I would be cautiously optimistic that we would find it. Um, and we do tend to find one section of the report I hadn't shown is that even if something doesn't fit into one of those scores, we have this raw results section. And uh -huh. this is where you can come and see absolutely every single species we detected. And what can be very interesting um, and how we actually uncovered one of these chronic abscess cases, uh, we actually found the root cause and were able to help the patient fix it, is by coming to this raw results section and seeing, do we see something that's comprising an extremely high abundance of their microbiome? Or are they in the 100th percentile or 98th percentile? And being able to dig deeper there. So we're still learning, but we want to enable you to as well. The Clinician's Corner podcast is sponsored by Restorative Wellness Solutions, the premier clinical training program for health practitioners who want to learn how to finally get to the root source of their clients' health concerns and help them reverse complex health challenges and chronic illness. You can't afford to keep guessing. Your clients can't afford it either. Today's clients are sicker than ever before. Their health histories are more complex than ever before and you simply can't deliver the results they crave or build the practice you desire without the right clinical skills. Enter Restorative Wellness Solutions Foundational Course, Mastering the Art and Science of Gastrointestinal Healing, our clinically proven systematic approach to restoring balance within the body that has helped over a thousand practitioners transform their clients' lives, grow their business, 
and change the way health is delivered. In less than 12 weeks, you'll develop the clinical skills and confidence you need to help your clients feel better faster. Learn how to work with advanced lab testing to identify food sensitivities and imbalances within the gut. Craft custom targeted protocols that truly resolve your client's gut issues and work safely and effectively with supplements to deliver consistently life-changing results. Visit MasterGutHealing.com to apply today. So I'm seeing a couple of use cases here since we're on that topic. So Ellen is sharing a case that we see this quite a bit, you know, sometimes when you have a client and we've been doing gut work and the she's talking about a fungal overgrowth in this case, but it can be any kind of stubborn gut infection. Um, and she, um, well, here, I'll, I'll read hers specifically. But yeah. um, so she's asking, if a client cannot get rid of fungal overgrowth in the GI as evidenced by not being able to get off antifungals without getting thrush, how would this test help us moving forward? So was it going to give us, you know, they're already doing a dental side and rinse, dental side and toothpaste and oral probiotics. So some of the, the basic things we would think right. about in terms of supporting the, you know, a, a balanced and diverse, well, I want to come back to that diversity piece, but yeah. um, the, um, but uh, let's say a balanced microbiome, oral microbiome, would this test be able to provide additional insights that can help her dig deeper with this type of client? So in this type of client, I would be really interested to see their bristle results because we do test for candida. We test for candida albicans and a number of other species. So I would be really interested to see, yeah. are we detecting an overabundance from the oral cavity that may be reseeding? Um, right. So, you know, maybe there are, we're huge fans of biocidin. We're um, doing some studies with them now, but um, you know, it's, You'll hear me come back to this quite a bit, that oral health is an evolving science, and yes. we're happy to be helping promote, push it forward. But those are the kind of instances where it'd be really interesting to see, are we seeing any type of species, maybe it's fungal, maybe it's more related with uh, our gut impact score, that could just be reseeding with inflammation. Or, you know, this is where we get really excited, because we can dig in and actually see do we find anything that could be leading to that? And then what can we start to do about it? Right. Excellent. Excellent. Mm -hmm. um, well, you mentioned the, the evolving nature of the science, and I want to make sure I come back to I see a question here from Teresa from at the, towards the, the beginning of our conversation, and I think it's pertinent now. She's asking, how well characterized is the oral microbiome to be able to discern sort of normal and healthy from from unbalanced because I think, you know, the microbiome, whether we're talking oral, digestive, you know, topical, I mean, the, it feels like it is just the, the next sort of frontier, right? You know, yeah. the, the research coming into it is just unbelievable. So where do you feel we're at with the research in terms of oral microbiome specifically? Yeah, I would, I'll preface with uh, one of my core beliefs about human biology is that the more we learn, the more we realize we don't know. So it is something that we're going to keep delving into. Um, thankfully, the, the oral microbiome and oral health do have decades of literature behind them, largely generally characterizing the pathogenic species. So, um, you know, if you ask dentists or hygienists, they could probably name five or six that are known to be the key drivers. Where we're really trying to take the field and where we're seeing the field advancing is understanding not just those pathogens, but really, you know, coming back to that community understanding yeah. and that idea of symbiosis and dysbiosis. Mm -hmm. It was when we were first starting Bristol, it was the first thing we wanted to identify. How well can we actually characterize healthy versus diseased microbiomes? So we ran a big study with the University of Pacific Dental School in San Francisco, um, where we were able to characterize tooth decay at over 80% accuracy and gum inflammation and gum disease at over 88% accuracy. Yeah. So. I know those don't sound great in terms of like academic test scores, but for diagnostics it tends to be, um, no, it was surprisingly accurate. accurate. Yeah. Well, and for, you know, I, I see some other examples in here and there's one in particular I want to follow up on, but I think in general, I mean, when you're talking about a test that's $160 that is non-invasive, um, it can't hurt, right? If you're fine, yeah. if you're running into something that isn't resolving and it feels like that oral microbiome could have a role in it, in my mind, I mean, if this was a thousand dollar test, it would be a different <laughs> conversation, but this is a $160 test. It's very simple. I will tell you all, I have taken it. We were hoping to actually have my results to go through with you um, today, but they weren't ready in time. But I will, I was saying to Brian, you know, it's, it's, we've, you know, we've all done saliva testing for hormones and things, and this is a tiny little bit compared to some of the other tests that we do. 
very, very easy to, to take. So, you know, such a non-invasive, inexpensive test that can give, if it can provide answers and insights that can allow you to dig in a little bit more, I think that it can't, it certainly can't hurt. Now, I want to dig into this. Molly's asking about H. pylori. And this is, you know, with H. pylori, there's always this debate of like, are we passing it back and forth? If there's, you know, a family situation and one member of the family has that H. pylori, it can be passed back and forth. And I know that there's some research showing that, you know, when you test families, they might all have H. pylori, but it's different, you know, strains or, or what have you. So um, I guess the question here is, you know, can can you be looking, or is, is H. pylori, is this test going to tell us if H. pylori is being passed back and forth? I'm reading into your question here, Molly, but I think that would be a really cool thing if this test could tell us that. Yeah, so we will detect H. pylori. It is something we report on. Um, in terms of whether it's transmitted around the household, that is a fascinating question. It would be something I'm very interested in. There is literature supporting transmission of oral microbiomes and oral bacteria throughout families. It's one of the reasons you often hear dentists um, advising not kissing babies on the mouth or small children because there's a common bacteria, Streptococcus mutans, that is extremely acidogenic, which means it's extremely uh, active at causing decay and cavities. And it's not no natively found in children's mouths, but if it gets introduced, that's where we can start to see putting children at risk of certain conditions like tooth decay or even things like gum inflammation because they're introducing that microbiome to them. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I hadn't actually heard that before. Mm -hmm. um, that is fascinating. Yeah. So many things you learn um, that yeah. we aren't taught, unfortunately. So hopefully more oral health education. So let's talk about, you know, so we get the information we've go through and I can see how the, you know, you provide it the, or the test results themselves kind of get, or the, the report, I should say, has divided it up into recommendations. Can you give some examples of some of the, the types of strategies that a nutrition professional could support their clients with? And then when are the, th what are the things they should be watching for where it's time to bring in formal, you know, you know, the dentist, but it's time to get medical here. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so first, we want to give you actionable things that you can be doing with your patients. And generally, I think when we think of things like toothpaste or mouth rinse, things tend to be very black and white. But literature actually supports that there's a number of different functions and things we can be doing depending on the patient's profile. Mm. So even just getting into toothpaste, for example, certain species or certain toothpaste are better at remineralizing teeth. Things like hydroxyapatite are a great solution there. But there's also species that are good at reducing sensitivity and encouraging the growth of beneficial bacteria. So toothpaste that contain arginine actually seem to inhibit biofilm formation in the oral cavity and feed some beneficial bacteria. If we skip down to things like mouthwash, I'll first caveat, you know, we generally are trying to avoid rinse, uh, advising antimicrobial mouthwash on frequent or daily use. There's pretty compelling literature that it eliminates or reduces the levels of beneficial bacteria. So we think it's a very time and a place type solution. But again, there's things like if you have moderate gum inflammation and halitosis, thymol and eucalyptol are actually some essential oils that have some compelling literature against moderate to uh, active halitosis and bad breath. For tooth decay, for example, xylitol is a great ingredient, and we know xylitol can cause gastric distress. So we always recommend it in moderation and generally in doses so we can try and rebalance that. Even things like diet, getting into how nitrate can feed those nitric oxide producing species. So more beets, more leafy greens, even nitrate supplements. Omega-3s have been shown to reduce gum inflammation and vitamin D, as I mentioned, has a higher uh, deficiency of vitamin D is associated with gum disease and cavities. So we have a nice spreadsheet um, that I'll share and a nice resource that actually goes in depth on all sorts of recommendations for tooth decay, halitosis and gum disease that you can take with your patient at home and you can recommend to your patient. In the report, we do have a treatment plan section that would be visible mm -hmm. to you and not to your patients mm -hmm. uh, because it does get into when we might recommend uh, bringing them in for some sort of in-office care, some in-office treatment. Mm -hmm. And that's when we think something like a referral to 
maybe a functional dentist um, or even just any other dentist can be helpful. And we'll try to give you some guidance too about what that severity is and why we think certain things could be used. Now in that treatment plan section, are you thinking, very, is it specific to teeth and oral health or are there recommendations in there of like, oh, we see these very elevated strains of this bacteria maybe recommend they go get a medical, like is there, does it actually take it to that next step of an actual recommendation for a medical workup or are you really kind of trusting the practitioner to have that level of expertise to know when further digging is warranted from that perspective? So I'm speaking of things that aren't necessarily dental in nature. Yeah, and I think that's where we are relying on some clinical expertise, candidly, because Mm -hmm. we do know that just the presence and abundance of certain pathogens isn't necessarily indicative of, you know, there's limiting causal evidence from a lot of these species. It's generally associative, but we've been really excited about how it's been received by the dental community. You know, it's been a silo for so long, and now we talk to so many practitioners who really see the test as this opportunity where, because practitioners see the gut impact score and they think, what do we do about this? You know, we don't know what to do about gut health. And that's when they start working with functional medicine providers or nitric oxide or you know, when you see those oral systemic health associations, we're huge proponents of bringing the mouth back into the body, both from right. a health and a medical standpoint. So not explicitly, but maybe that's something we need to be working on is when to include those points and, uh, you know, how to enable that reference that way. Yeah, that would be really fascinating. Mm-hmm. Um, Donna's got a great question here. She says, I'm assuming that some of the bacteria that show up on this test are not necessarily found on the GI map, which doesn't specifically test for those for, for all the things, right? So in your opinion, does, mo- does most of the mouth bacteria make it into the gut? And has anyone ever tested this? We talk about that translocation. Yeah. Is it something that we can just assume that if it's in the mouth, it's in the gut and vice versa? Another fantastic question. I'm, that's why I was so excited to be speaking with you. Audience. <laughs> so generally, the oral bacteria do not colonize the gut. So as you know, we're swallowing saliva, but we do have a number of different um, mechanisms that are trying to prevent that. So we have our immune system, we have actual stomach lining, we have mucosal barriers that are all designed to try and prevent the oral bacteria from getting in. But typically when we see that translocation, if the gut is in an inflamed state, or if we know the immune system's compromised, or if there is some other contributing factor that leads to the breakdown of those barriers, that's when we start to see more of this um, colonization by oral Mm -hmm. bacteria or the um, passage of inflammatory factors into the gut. So maybe it's not the bacteria directly, but if we know they're seeding constant inflammation and then the gut line is... um, weakened, that's when we can start to see perhaps it's not even the bacteria, but instead these inflammatory factors are drawing immune cells. And we see that associated with things like SIBO, um, where the over-presentation of certain immune cells in the mouth or in the oral cavity can then present in subsequent uh, downstream effects. So that would make sense. That would make sense. I get um, Courtney is suggesting here also probably depends on the hydrochloric acid status, which I would imagine is a piece of that as well. Yeah. Um, how much, if any, does oral dysbiosis affect cranial issues or ringing in the ears? Is there research on that you're aware of? So that's a great question. That isn't something I'm as familiar with. Um, I do know there are some musculoskeletal disorders that have associations with oral dysbiosis and some oral pathogens, but this is one of those things that falls into topics I would love to explore one day. (laughs) Things that, you know, we're kind of running community science experiments, working with practitioners where we have a lot of practitioners who see a certain patient base or know patients with certain symptoms and are running their own, I don't want to call it citizen science, but you know, putting that forward. And that's where the testing's great is since we look at everything, we can actually measure, did this modulate the microbiome in a way that might be interesting? Yeah. So I don't want to forget about, you said you had a really cool example of that, that concept around the diversity of the oral microbiome. Can you share? Yeah, absolutely. This is one I, we love speaking about, and it actually ties to a question Ellen had asked in the chat where she said, what about a client who has an abscess on the jaw that's not resolving with antibiotics? Could this test help figure out what's going on? 
been to 13 docs, biological dentist, nothing definitive. So this is very similar to the patient um, we were working with. Yeah. So this patient had actually had other tests done, um, similar to Bristol, but PCR-based, where they're looking at 5 or 20 bacteria. Everything came back negative. The patient saw a periodontist. They saw, I think, three different periodontists, specialists, other dentists. All tests came back negative. And this patient was struggling with chronic dental abscessing. So every month or very frequently, the patient was having these very painful abscesses and otherwise had impeccable home care. Um, he has much better home care than I do and was very compliant on diet and everything, but we could not figure this out. Antibiotics, antimicrobials, nothing was addressing it. So we were lucky to connect with his dentist who decided to run a bristle test. And what we found was all of the scores came back basically zero. So he had no risk for gum disease, no risk for tooth decay. And it was very odd, except for the diversity score was 0 0.1. So he had no diversity in his mouth. And when we looked at the species, we found that 50 to 60% of his microbiome was a single species called Serratia marsicans. This species is not native to the mouth. It's actually commonly found in tile grout. If you ever see tile grout with like an orangish color. Yeah. So you start thinking how could that have been transmitted, maybe toothbrush right. on the tile, something like that. But basically we dug in and saw, okay, this is very interesting. We found a paper that actually showed that it was sensitive to xylitol and okay. the oral probiotic lactobacillus ruteri. So we cut the antimicrobials and instead put the patient on a pretty dedicated regimen of xylitol and lactobacillus ruteri. And over a course of six months, actually shifted their microbiome to have nearly, I think there were nine out of 10 on the beneficial bacteria score. And we brought that serratia marsicans down to single percent, or I think even near indetectable levels. And since then, the patient has not had any dental abscessing. So it's an N of one. We've actually recreated it with a few other patients. But, you know, those are the kinds of things where it's like a streetlight problem. You can only mm -hmm. see what you're looking for. And so that's where we get really excited that you weren't going to see it in the bristle score that serratia marsicans was high. We've since fixed that, but it's where you can start to dig deeper on these really difficult cases. So for clinicians who are starting to use these test tests, you know, the report itself is so helpful in terms of guiding, but you know, that kind of thinking that you're just sharing, do you, do you have a resource team? Like, is there, is there, are there resources for practitioners to get some support in learning how to interpret the tests properly, learning how to troubleshoot these more challenging cases, exactly like what you just imagined? I can, I can pretty much feel Ellen through the, through the <laughs> screen, ordering this test for her client and, mm -hmm. and, you know, then wanting to be like, help, what do I do with the responses yep. to this, you know? And so, um, um, how how can practitioners get guidance on on this interpretation, especially for the finicky cases? Yeah, so we include free training for clinicians. So when you get your first patient results back, we love doing results reviews. So we have a biological hygienist on our team who will do that training um, and will actually go through your results with you. And when we find those kind of out there cases, that's when the rest of the team just likes to pitch in. Um, but generally, we're starting to, these rare cases are starting to become more common um, mm -hmm. as more people test. And I think we'll realize they probably aren't that rare. Um, but yeah, so we include that free training. So anyone, when they order their tests, when they get those first patient results back, if it's unclear what to do next, that's where we really want to be there to help you. Yeah, fascinating. Thank you. So um, Molly is asking about teeth grinding. She says, I've seen many theories on teeth grinding. Do you see any contributing factors from oral health? And then vice versa, do you see the impact on oral health based on teeth grinding? Yeah, so I don't know that we see an explicit oral microbiome signature, but teeth grinding um, is falls into this other camp of where I think dentistry needs to, is expanding, where we're seeing a big explosion of interest. I'd say it's under airway issues as well, things like teeth grinding and proper sleep. Um, so teeth grinding tends to manifest as more so where we'll see people with decay issues. Um, it's very visible by um, 
by dentists, they can generally tell if you're teeth grinding. Um, I think if you're seeing broader jaw issues, jaw pain issues, um, even chronic headaches, I think have been tied to certain teeth grinding or teeth clenching. Mm -hmm. So definitely does have a big impact. We think it's important to get checked out and something to encourage your patients for or identify, you know, what those things can look like. I think it generally mm -hmm. presents on the molars. I myself wear a mouth guard because um, right. we know there's so many components like mouth breathing or stress that can actually play a role in um, leading to more teeth grinding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does it have an impact on the microbiome itself? That's I can see how mouth heard. breathing could. A yeah. Grinding, I don't know, these might be theoretical questions that haven't been explored yet. Yeah, it's um, so they definitely fall into the theoretical space, but we do have folks who are doing airway work who generally will see patients having lower nitric oxide related species, which is interesting. We also generally see a shift towards higher tooth decay species when folks are mouth breathing. Saliva is actually one of your best friends in terms of preventing oral disease. And when you're not, when you're breathing through your mouth at night, we're reducing the levels of saliva. So we tend to see shifts of the microbiome towards more pathogenic states. And this is where I know I'm preaching to the choir here. One test, one analyte can be very descriptive, but that's where when you can factor in all these other components of things right. that could be influencing their health, all of a sudden these diagnostic odysseys or these treatment odysseys can hopefully be addressed shorter. Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, you have, I've, I've, you really answered all my questions. Is there anything else? And folks who are here live, if you have other questions, please post them in the chat. Ooh, mm -hmm. here's a good one from Donna. Have yep. you tested people with braces, metal or Invisalign? So when we're introducing, you know, metals and things and plastics into the mouth, I'm sure that's got to have an impact. Yeah. So I don't believe it's a study we've run ourselves. Mm -hmm. We were starting to look into dental appliances and mm -hmm. actually mouth guards because we had an initial hypothesis that that would lead to a shift. Um, and we didn't find anything too damning about wearing a mouth guard. Um, okay. We found to the question on cleaning those though, yeah. this is where it is important. So cleaning your mouth guard and cleaning your toothbrush and storing your toothbrush safely and away from the toilet is actually pretty important. Um, we've actually found, and we've had some awkward conversations where um, you can actually find a certain species that are generally associated with the gut microbiome and not the oral microbiome, um, or have actually been isolated from near toilets on toothbrushes. And then those tend to be opportunistic species. So similarly, you can have some of these species that aren't <laughs> fun to describe manifesting as bad breath or manifesting as yeah. interesting symptoms. Um, so would recommend cleaning those thoroughly. For anyone who is wondering, what do you, and I'm so curious now, because I'm glad we're having this conversation. I'm, my husband and I have an ongoing disagreement about what is safe storage of the toothbrush. So I'm going to let you answer that question and settle this uh, family dispute. What is safe storage of a toothbrush? Yeah, so I believe uh, I'll need to get the specifics. I'll follow up with this. But generally, if there is any sort of separation of direct air pathway from mm -hmm. the toilet to the toothbrush, so if it's around a corner, if it's covered by a cabinet, something like that is generally safest. Mm -hmm. um, the other criteria there, trying to keep your toothbrush dry. So after you have used it, Make sure you're drying it. If there's liquids left behind on, that's the kind of environment where microbes really yeah. like to thrive. And make sure you're changing your toothbrush or your toothbrush head every few months because that's another area where, or after certain viral infections, people will generally recommend changing it out as well. So for dry, so I'm thinking of, you know, like the, the electronic toothbrush, it has that little plastic thing on the top, right? That like goes over the actual toothbrush head, would you recommend not using that and putting it somewhere where there's airflow to allow it to dry, but nowhere near the toilet so that it's not actually, I just want the toothbrush, not even in the bathroom. You I'm got saying. it. So, <laughs> jury's out of it. There, there's, you know, you, you, when you get into oral health, you realize there's these, uh, wars yeah. going on, on certain things totally. like this, but generally what people recommend is not using toothbrush covers for that exact purpose that okay. it can lead to that. So dry, uninhibited or I guess inhibited air environment uh, right. is generally our recommendation. Yeah. 
Um, you mentioned cleaning a toothbrush. How do you recommend actually cleaning a toothbrush? So I see somebody in here asking about hydrogen peroxide. That's one solution mm -hmm. we've seen. Generally, I think diluted mm -hmm. hydrogen peroxide. Um, I have one of those red light UV cleaners mm -hmm. where you can basically Sonicare is what I have and you put it in mm -hmm. and you close it and it hits it and then cleans it that way. Um, okay. which I'll do periodically. Um, so UV sterilizer as Courtney said, I believe. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Such great tips. Thank now you. you have a special deal for everybody here for, um, for our, um, for our alumni. So you want to share what that is? Yeah. So we are so excited to be working with your community, um, and all of your practitioners, you know, we love feedback. So we constantly, the way we improve the report is by getting fantastic feedback by great clinicians and forward thinking clinicians. So we want to give you all the opportunity to try it. So we are offering the test at nearly 50% off. So $90 per test, um, as opposed to $169 on our website. Um, we've got the chat in the our, we've got the link in the chat here, and I'm sure we'll post it elsewhere as well. But, you know, really encourage you if you have interest in this, if you're interested in it for your patients, nothing beats going through the experience. So we love having practitioners try it and then speaking with you about it, being able to talk you through your own results and, and train you up on that. That's wonderful. This has been so educational. Thank you so much. Um, oh, question here from Courtney. Is this something that HSA will cover, or it looks like it is something that we'll cover. Yeah. So we'll generally see HSA and FSA reimburse, um, yeah, yeah. The charges here. If you need an itemized receipt, just email our support team and we will get it back to you. And Perfect. somebody asked about signing up to be a practitioner. So if you go through that type form link that Margaret sent, we will follow up with you about getting your account set up and how walk you through how to order and everything. You can also find more information on our website, bristlehealth.com. And we have a provi providers tab there. Awesome. Yes. And I see instructions here. To, if you fill out that form at the end of the screen, you're going to get the discount code and the link to purchase at that deep discount. That is so generous of you. Thank you so much. I'm sure lots of folks would love to try this. I know I'm very, I'm very excited slash a little nervous to see my test results. Yep. Um, there's, you know, that moment of truth. Um, so it's going to be great though. Thank you so much, Brian. Really, really appreciate your time and, um, and this innovation. And I'm sure it's something that you guys are, you know, a lot, sounds like you're doing a lot of good research and keeping, you know, just from looking at the way that you provide the, all that data in the reports, it looks like you guys are doing a really good job of really keeping this as current as possible and staying up to date with the latest research. So thank you for your incredible work. Yeah. And thank you so much for the conversation and all the incredible work you do. Um, I know you all are the biggest patient advocates and patients need it. And so thank you so much for sharing what we're doing. Uh, like I said, you know, we love to nerd out on this. We are very passionate about the role oral health plays in our overall health. So thank you so much, Margaret. It was a truly a pleasure and we loved answering all the questions. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you for joining me for another episode of the Clinician's Corner. Don't forget to head to the show notes to access additional links and resources. And if you liked today's episode, please be sure to hit the follow button and consider leaving a review, sharing it on social, or texting it to a colleague. The more we spread the word, the more lives we can impact for the better.